product that would give you an avenue for making money as well as to solve problems for companies? Uh well, I, I first heard about it when I was doing my coach training. And so when you do a decent coach training, what you learn there is really the, the basics, active listening, uh, the framework, um, how, how to build, set a good uh, coaching agreement and all of that. You practice all of that. But um, when they attended us to or pointed, pointed the existence of, of, uh, of positive intelligence out and I looked at their website, what I found is like this is a really practical hands-on tool that you can add to the framework that you have as a coach. So it gives people immediate tools, but insights, vocabulary, and a tool, those three things into their own thinking, but also it changes the way you, you deal with others. And I thought like, you know, if you only have, you know, your, you have your existing experience, what I have as an entrepreneur and having worked with like uh, a lot of people, in my previous business life, um, and then the coaching skills, then this thing is a perfect add-on. And so what I've found over the last years that every time when I read a, a book or I, I, I attend a training or whatever, um, I always find like, man, this is packed in those six weeks. They distilled the essence and they packed it in the six weeks. I'm amazed every time. So, the six weeks being that there's a this, uh, program yeah. that they offer that is a very intense uh, introduction, chapter by chapter, of positive intelligence that give you the skills of understanding your saboteurs as well as your sage side and how they handle each of that with both within yourself and with another person, I guess. Yeah, I haven't. Taken yeah, exactly. It. So over the course of six weeks, what you actually get to do is, uh, of course, you do a saboteur test, which gives you the insight into who, what your saboteurs are. Um, and then little by little, all these pieces get pulled apart and you, you get an introduction in, in a certain way of thinking, but also you get uh, trained in get, training the habit of, of, of doing PQ reps, positive intelligence reps, which are an analogy uh, with if you would do reps, repetitions in the gym. Uh, and they're actually mini meditations. There are many ways to get from your uh, mind into your body, very simply. If you have negative chatter in your head, which overwhelms you, um, you can say, I go meditate for half an hour. But if you're, if you're in the midst of a conversation or in a board meeting or whatever, just lie in the middle of life, that's not so practical. So these things really, you, you train your mind in six weeks to, to uh, instead of being overwhelmed, going into a calm, and then you can make better decisions, not out of emotions, but out of what we call sage uh, perspective. So that's basically what you get in those six weeks. You also, you also learn about uh, the different stages. You learn about uh, how, how you can turn a negative event into something positive. And these are really all things that you can find in, 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 in different sco schools of life. Uh, but they're pretty universal. And that's the beauty of it. It's just packed in these six foundational training weeks, which are not time intensive, but they're um, yeah emotionally intensive at times because it's quite confronting in a very positive sense as well. So you walk away being super empowered. Like, wow, you know, if, if you have a shit day and you come after work, you come in the kitchen and your wife is there, you just feel like all, all, all wound up. You could have an argument, but because you understand your saboteurs and you understand when your saboteurs are triggered because she might say something or you say something to her, you can stop it right there and say, oh, do I want this? Who is talking to me in my head? I don't accept this. You do a PQ rep, can be visual or tactile uh, or any other of the senses that you use. And so you step away from uh, from this negative emotion that pops up and you you, you make a positive choice. And so it the, the negativity simply doesn't get the chance to, to bubble up like an atomic bomb because that's the feeling we often have, like boom, this rush of negativity popping up. So that's what the first thing that you 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 learn, and it, that sinks in pretty quickly. Another thing is that you become aware of how you talk to yourself, 
and the impact it has towards others. A lot of trainings uh, and mindset trainings are basically about uh, how you how you talk to yourself because change is a matter of changing your perception of how you see things. And that always starts with your biased outlook on the world. And uh, we waste so much time wanting to change the situation, the others and whatever. Whereas if we just change our outlook, we we gain massive energy that we can use for other stuff. And so that's why if I start working with uh, with clients, most of the time I start with this training because it takes the edge away for them. Um, it calms them down immediately. And then I have the chance to start working on on the stuff that really matters to them, uncovering it and building a life around that. So yeah, that yields pretty fast results. That, that's uh, that's really interesting. I'd like to take an example because you just gave the, the whole construction of the whole thing right there of positive intelligence as as much as I've scanned you know the information. So the way that he's broken out that the, everyone has one dominant to three dominant saboteurs, right? Something like that. They're, they're common ways in which you move out of self-worth into a negative emotion. And, uh, and you seem to be motivating yourself negatively, you would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the negative motivation creates a limited perception or say a fixed mindset over the the problem well what happens it's about uh, so it, it's about one of the basic concept concepts is uh, so we have 10 saboteurs and the main saboteur is the judge the judge judges you the other and the circumstances and if you come to think of it just walk into a room or walk down the street and you look around you'll you'll have an opinion of everybody and everything all the time that's what your mind is doing all the time and that's okay, as long as you see it for what it is. It's just an opinion. You don't even have to be attached to it. The thing is that we put, we, we're attached to it. We think that's the truth. And so we start comparing ourselves to the other. We start to create opinions, which is very con energy consuming. Now you have nine other saboteurs, like a hyperachiever saboteur, a pleaser saboteur, a victim saboteur. The, the roots of these saboteurs, they lie in what are your biggest talents. And so what happens is as a, as a young, well, as let's say as a, as a human being, we're dependent, dependent on our, we're mammals and we're dependent on our parents or other caretakers for us to be able to survive. In our limited worldview as depending little creatures, we cannot understand, we cannot cope with the fact that um, the others would be incompetent to take care of us. So we construct a story that the, that the fault lies with us. But the toolbox to do this, to, to cope with that is our, our talents because that's what we have, our innate talents. So if you're a very sociable, sympathetic person, it might be that during that time, you try to get attention and love, and it doesn't mean you need to have a, ch a, a traumatizing childhood or anything. I mean, it's just how how we grow up, uh, and it does it's, it has nothing to do with blaming your parents or anything. So it could be that you uh, start to use these talents that you have a good feeling for how people are. You you have this sense for it, and you start using that more often, and so you get a positive reaction. So you think that your the love or the care for somebody else depends on the other person. And so your self-love might be depending on the recognition of the other. And this is how you can develop a pleaser saboteur. You have a lot of people who say, yeah, I'm a pleaser. No, you're not a pleaser. You have a pleaser saboteur. This is you, this is your saboteur, and this is the other person. And so you can really take that apart. Well, Having a please a saboteur is a problem when um, you only the 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 you 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 get motivated through the negative emotions 
from this saboteur or any saboteur, so to speak. That's the difference. Mo uh, saboteurs motivate you through negative emo emotions, fear, shame, guilt, and all these kind of things. They say, like, if you do this, you're worth of existing. But basically, they're talents. So it would be like you have a very potent car and you're constantly driving it in like the, the red zone. It doesn't work. Your car, your motor will just burn out. And uh, so it's not bad. And so what we do is take them for what they are. It's like they're super talents. Acknowledge them for what they are. The world needs your talents. The world actually needs the things that the roots of your saboteur. But we learn to use them in a positive, in a sage manner. So they positively motivate you instead of negatively. Like a hyperachiever saboteur will always tell you like, okay, you made a big win in your business and blah, blah, blah. And say, okay, you know, um, yeah, that's okay. But, you know, he's doing better. And uh, now we go to the next one. You don't even get time to enjoy it. It's never good enough. It should always be better, 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 better. And so you're just whipping yourself all the time. Your saboteur is doing that. Whereas you've, you've made something really, really decent. You've created something really good. But this negative motivation causes you a lot of stress. And it's an un these negative emotions are super draining and they narrow your mind because they don't, uh, uh, they, they actually cut off your creative part of your brain. He explains this neurologically in in his book that uh, the, the narrowing of the mind, cutting off the circulation of that creative zone. How would you describe what what's happening on a neurological level when you're in a saboteur versus uh, in the sage? Uh, well, it's there's a lot of uh, scientific research around that. It's you have your task uh, mode network and your default mode network. Your task network is more oriented to um, the cognitive stuff I, and, and calculation and all that, the practical task things. And the default mode network is what happens when your mind is wandering. It lays new create, creative, uh, creates new creative links. And so what you basically do, if you're saboteur driven, so by the negative emotions, what happens is that you, you're, you're in a, yeah, what you would say, and all the, this is not uh, neuroscientifically correct. The lizard brain, what you hear in popular media a lot of times, you go into fight, flight, or uh, freeze mode. So all your energy is focused towards one of these three, three things. It's like, okay, I need to survive this situation. That's the main goal. You're not in a silent place where you say, let's look what works best here. And so what happens if you go into the other mode, the default mode network, and they're communicating uh, powers so if one goes up the other goes down and the other way around and so as you um, the more you go into the default which is what you're saying is the saboteur driven if i understand no, right. the other way around yeah that you cannot say it's it's 100 percent like that saboteur driven the saboteur mode focus you mainly on task um, mode it's really executing and it's very uh, logical and all that but it also yeah relates to internal patterns the default mode network is really when you start to wander around. That's where your creative part is, but you need both. If you only have the default, the creative part, nothing's gonna happen. If you only have the task mode network, nothing's gonna happen either. Or something might happen, but you burn out. Sounds very the left brain, right brain conversation to me. Yeah, that's how they call it, but even that doesn't really exist. But that's basically what it comes down to, yeah. Um, and, and so- you're saying that if the saboteur is not leaning necessarily toward cognitive calculation, nor is it leaning toward a wandering mind. It is just fight, flight, freeze with being driven by anger, uh, detachment and anxiety or guilt, right? Yeah, it's a negative motivation to get you to do um, what what your saboteur thinks that is helpful for you. And our society also, also, um, yeah, prepares us for that. If you just look at the schooling system, you are somebody if you have good grades. So if you fit into that system, you're fantastic. If you're different, you're not. And that's that's an oversimplification, of course, but... Uh, 
Well, that's going into the conditioning of the society. And you can say school system or corporation or any family yeah. dynamic. But what is it in this example that you see related to the fight, flight, freeze response and the conditioning of the school system and how this can be understood uh, from Saboteur and Sage? Well, you want to please, for example, if you uh, your your very existence or the fact that you're being recognized by somebody outside of you depends on their approval. It's external approval. They approve you because they've been conditioned that way as well. But you're already good enough the way you were born. You were you were already perfect the way you when you were born. But we. We put on these layers through conditioning and through every experience that we gain that we don't see ourselves for who we truly are. So we believe that story. Advertising is adding up to that and, and actually exploiting this weakness or yeah, this flaw that we have inside of ourselves. And so um, once you see the, the mechanics that is behind the negative mind chatter, you can and what you can do about it and see it for what it truly is, you can start to heal that thing and become more complete and, and start to see yourself for who you are. But that's, that's just one aspect of it. You also see the other people are suffering from the same thing. And it can be a very simple, like a very simple thing in a corporate setting, for example, you, have, you can have a sales, a sales rep who's done a fantastic deal, like how highly energized goes into a, into the accounting department, you know, I've got this deal, blah, blah, blah. And then the accounting department who logically has, uh, let's say a controller saboteur says, bam, no, not possible. Boof, you have a conflict. But they're both defending the same interest only from a different perspective. Your reaction could be like, I don't like this woman from accounting. They're, she's always sabotaging me or blah, or blah. No, she's doing her job. You're doing your job. And you can actually see those two saboteurs in the middle fighting each other. And you can look at them and say, and because the way you know the, the vocabulary, you say, you can have a laugh, look at this. Okay, let's take a breath, let's calm down and let's see where the problem lies and how we can understand each other instead of fighting the person. So in this example, for, as a consultant, you're seeing the mechanics of what it is both in yourself when uh, you get triggered in a fight, flight, freeze, where do you respond to as something of a negative winning formula as opposed to a depositive, more fulfilling side? Uh, and when you are seeing in this example, a sales rep who is uh, just closed a great sale and he's now having to go to accounting, he may be having either the overachiever, the people pleaser, you know, we wanting some uh, applause. And he then meets an accountant who that day also is wa wanting to defend that they may have a not enough story that they are, uh, and, and they're a way of, of dealing with it is uh, an insecurity of not having done their proper accounting to meet because of mistake, mistakes get very visible fast. So he might go into a controlling saboteur. Now you have a people-pleasing saboteur or an overachiever meeting the controller. And what you're saying is that you can observe that from the outside and as a consultant, resolve that conflict by exposing the mechanics of it and, and then help guide them to the positive side of the emotions that motivate them positively and speak from a sage point of view from that place, right? Yes. Or how we, yeah. I'm sure you have a better way of saying it. This is just what I infer from what you've just said. Yeah, what you basically do is you do, you would, you would do an internal PQ rep where you get the emotion out. That could be like some, uh, like with your fingers or with your eyesight or by hearing, just going out of your, your mind into your body and then let let the energy go out. And then you can start to talk on another level. You would start to explore, okay, what is happening here? And there's different techniques for that. Um, how to find, okay, what if or the if then? Let's 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 see what the common ground is and build upon that instead of just flashing each other off. 
But if you do that on a company scale, it just it just changes everything. One of the things that uh, that you can do is create. Uh, there's a test where you can find out what your positivity ratio is, and that needs to be above seventy five percent because for every uh, negative encounter, you need three positive encounters, and that's just ingrained in our primitive survival mechanism. We've been programmed for this because it made sense in the past. <laughs> so if you're in a, if you're in, let's say, if you're at 55 as an individual, that means that you're very negatively driven and it, there's a negative vortex that pulls you down. And if you start to train yourself to do the opposite and you come above the 75, automatically, if something negative will happen, it just goes off your, it runs off your skin almost so you can place it. You don't become naive. It's not like you don't allow negativity to to uh, to enter your life because, of course, negative events happen. But it's the way you deal with that. That's on an individual level. But company, you can also create a, a score for the company by just adding up the the numbers of the individuals. So if you have a have a team in a in a setting uh, in a challenging setting, let's say a crisis, and they're very negative, they're never going to get out of it. But if you if you manage to change this, then basically their minds will start to connect and they will lift each other up. They will be, become more cooperative, get better solutions, and they will be able to confront and handle, uh, tackle challenges a lot better. And that, of course, in, in the long run, it results in in, uh, in better in better figures for the company. I understand that uh, having a more positive understanding uh, of, of how to deal with this uh, excites more creativity. If you take for somebody that is easily distracted, procrastination, I guess, is also a saboteur, right? Or is there is that one? Or is that just universally a problem? Uh, I think it's a universal problem, which is uh, also, um, well, it, it evokes a lot of feelings of guilt and shame. Yes. But uh, I think everybody procrastinates. I'm not sure whether that's necessarily uh, a saboteur driven um, act, um, although you could like, look into it. There's different factors I think that play a role in procrastination. I think uh, one of the things is if you're working above your competence, maybe you're insecure. It could be indeed your hyper achiever saboteur is saying, look, it's uh, you can't execute it perfectly, so you better not do it. You start to procrastinate it. So yeah, well, it could actually be uh, you could. I think it's different saboteurs playing a different role for different people in this in this uh, in this way. Yeah, but there's I think majority of people procrastinate in some or in some field. I think it's so uh, like to use a simple example where yeah. you know somebody who let's take that sales rep who must do accounting, right? Sales reps hate to do the accounting and the paperwork, right? It's not that they're not capable, they're very smart people, but do actually look at the figures also tends to bring up all the problems of where they where judgment might lie, where they feel an insecurity, they lose their positive bubble. Uh, they look at the worry of, gosh, you know, the figures aren't actually this was a great sale, but if you look at the big picture, we're having a, a rough quarter and that demotivates. And I was positive making sales. Now I'm in a demotivating factor and feeling more insecure. Why would I do that to myself? And so they put off the, uh, the accounting task until they may feel more resourceful. But that, so if you were with that person, how would you guide them to do the accounting <laughs> to get compliant? Well, first of all, they need to have proper accounting skills um, to start with, because if you're working under your competency, uh, of course, uh, inevitably you'll feel insecure. And if you're super insecure, you won't be motivated. That's to start with. Um, I'm not so sure whether a sales rep, if they, his talents don't lie there, should be doing this. I mean, on a deeper level. And... Um, I think it's important in that sense that you you could use the accounting to to visualize the progress that somebody's making, but I think the worst thing you can do is put somebody on a spot that he or she doesn't be uh, belong. That that's that's why people become unhappy, even if the job pays well, which is one of the dramas we have uh, 
in today's society. Go do that. You'll make good money. Yeah, people study eight years to be to be a, a, an attorney, and then they find out that they don't like it. They waste the time and money. Maybe they would have been, I don't know, an excellent uh, piano player or 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 uh, I don't know, an, uh, a, a sales rep or whatever, you know, or be an excellent in running a business. So yeah, skilled but unhappy. Think, yeah, they got the skills, but they're unhappy and it's not fulfilling, right? Well, they will not excel in the skills either, because they will always compete with somebody who is really motivated, who is actually working in in their zone of genius, and. Uh, for them, it would become like it's effortless almost. Of course, it requires an effort, but the motivation comes from the inside, not from like, you know, I'll get status or I get this or I get that. So I so would say is there's a resistance that everyone has that might actually. So this is where I, I, I play with a little bit. And I'm curious how you would solve this particular puzzle that everyone is in a growth mindset, especially in our industry. And there's, but they they reach limitations. One one approach is to move into your zone of genius and sky go sky with the and and capitalize on the way that you're designed. The other part is to grow in maturity, and, and what Vishen Lakiani said in on stage is the Ken Show moments where these painful moments keep coming over and over bringing anxiety anger guilt until you at some point figure out how to develop yourself to break through that and grow into at least being 15% masterful in accounting that ultimately leads to a better sense of having traction in your sales you understand what i'm saying so i'm curious how is it that you are how does positive intelligence and as well in your own style do you deal with that problem of growth in areas where resistance is well i think that if there is a really deep resistance that we should look into what the reason is that there is so much resistance i think if it's very far away of where your core talents lie um i think it's much more helpful to look into what it is that you really want to do and step away from the financial goals that keep us stuck and uh of course, they play a role. I'm not denying that, but I think it's very important to create a place where you can think freely of any burden and any fear. The moment that you realize that, and it's good, you can go back to the example of, of what Vision said. Very nice that you can make a 15% increase, but um, let, let's, let's, let's just say, if I would be a runner, a long distance runner, that would be a really stupid idea. I got short legs, for example. So I can train my ass off and I can make even 50% progress, probably 100%. But I'll always be a shit runner. So, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to put any effort in there, whereas it could be that I could be a sailing champion. So why would I waste my life, my energy, in, not, in, in a field where my interest probably doesn't lie or where my talents don't lie. Whereas there's something else where I'm good at. So I think it doesn't make any sense. It's like you can, you, can, you can drive a car with square wheels probably if the motor is strong enough and you make them turn in a weird way. But is it efficient? No. It's better with round wheels. So And certainly more efficient than... Uh, or, or less efficient than maybe somebody whose zone of genius that is, right? Yeah. So when you're coming in and you're seeing, okay, maybe this isn't your zone of genius, uh, but they're all, everyone's wanting to grow. What you're saying is grow in the area where you're appreciated, right? And where you experience more positive rewards in that area versus pushing against like, a tulip in the in the in the sidewalk that ultimately does create maybe a long-standing moment. So you're, this seems to be more the Satori idea, which is I'm going to meditate on what is naturally fulfilling and just continue taking the long game. That Satori moments create a, a better life. But that's even that's the beauty. The moment that you know you're on that spot, it is a very weird feeling. But it's it's like the light goes on literally like above your head, you could be successful 
to outside standards, but in the inside, you can be hyper miserable, even with 10 million on your bank account. Right. Because you're filling a hole in your heart that you cannot fill with, with outside success or money. The opposite is true as well. The moment that you are working with what your innate talents are, and so you are using them in function of the benefit of others, then your life will be fulfilling. We all want to be seen. We all want to be um, useful to the tribe, so to speak. It's in our system. Got it. So, but society yeah. prepares us uh, much in, in a very utilitarian way. We're being seen as a toolbox. I, I need, we need these skills here, we need these skills there. So we train an X number of people in these skills and then we put them here and there and there. We let them do shit jobs and they're unhappy. No, I think it's, it should be the other way around. And so the mo but the problem is that you you create a life around you quite often with with all the well with the mortgage and the responsibilities that you have and it happens also when you start a business you 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 discover something as an entrepreneur and you find like wow this is the stuff that's really needed you start to build a business and before you know it becomes a success but then all the managerial things come around and then yeah, you can't let that go because there's 500 families being fed of this. And, you know, I, uh, but it, it deprives you of your own self growth and development. And just to also, you need to step away from the image that the world has from you. So it's, it's, it can be a, a, an identity crisis. So you need to create a very, very intimate, safe space for people to simply vent that feeling and say, you know, actually, what I would love to do. And it often comes after a few coaching sessions that that phrase comes, well, what I would really love to do is, and then a big but. And uh, yeah. And when they're, and what you're hearing is their zone of genius. Yeah. It's, it's hanging in front of their face. What and, I would uh, really love is, and then your what comes out is their zone of genius, which is yeah. actually in your view has been hidden by the saboteur, or at least represented by, because it's always the same zone of genius attached to the same saboteur in your thinking or in the the book's thinking, right? Uh, well, there, there is, yeah, there, there is a. It, your zone of genius is more refined than what you would define as uh, by a saboteur. I think a saboteur is just one of the. It's it's the rough framework to to expose things and to make them tangible. Uh, you need to go more refined and more deeper, but it's you can call it out. A hyper achiever saboteur is fantastic because it motivates you to do great things. If it's being used for the right goal, it's amazing. If you have a pleaser saboteur, the same. If you're in a in a in a setting where care is, for example, an, an important trait, let's say in education, for example, that is amazing. But no, it's not amazing when your self-image is depending on doing er, saying yes to everybody. It doesn't work yeah. so, because you would you would uh, you would deplete yourself. So it's a lot. It has a lot to do with managing your own energy levels as well. First thing is really to take care of yourself, and that's why it's so important that these things are exposed. These saboteurs you're saying could create positive energy. If you would flip them, yes, absolutely. If we flip. don't really in the in the positive intelligence program, we do it don't do it as such. But uh, I I tend to look with my clients that it uh, from such a uh, point of view, yes. See, what I've noticed is that a lot of times, just accepting that you're angry, accepting that you're anxious, accepting that you're uh, uh, feeling detached in a particular area, does a lot to already generate move it out of the shadow into the light and then that becomes a resource of creativity for that person rather than trying to suppress their anger anxiety guilt etc and then they can deal with it and then they can deal with the emotions that are supposedly regulatory they're short term they're trying to protect you in a negative way but they're going turning into a long-term stress but they're stressful and they're creating a contraction in you 
And now you're trying to figure out how to manage that contraction every single day. So when you are working with that, you're seeing how would you then move somebody out of that contracted place into a place of their zone of genius when they're so habitually in it? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's where you could say um, that, that's where saboteurs make it visual <clears throat> because basically what a saboteur is, is, is the, is the, the habit of reacting in a certain manner to a certain external circumstance. So you would actually say like, if, if, if an event happens, like which saboteur you think is playing out here? And I'm like, oh yeah, fuck. Yeah. There he is again. Okay. What, what would you do if, the next time it happens and you feel literally the feeling of arousal. Uh, you have kids? Yes, two. How old and, are they? Yeah. And, you know, I, there, there's seven and there's four and there's repetitive stress disorders. You know, some things yeah. are not stressful asking them to, to brush their teeth. But when you've done it 45 times, when they know they need to be doing it, that's when it becomes really, really stressful. And there's a saboteur that would come out in me called the dictator because I'm getting angry and I'm now becoming, uh, you know, Chichesco about this. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes really the feeling can be literal as I, I've, I've had a teenage daughter who was not so easy in her teenage years. And sometimes uh, I would think like, oh, I'm pretty grounded now. But then she can make like a one remark and it would be like sticking your fingers into a wall socket. Well, that is like saboteur at, at, at its best. Like, <clears throat> and then you really realize like, shit, you know, this is coming up and, and you can, or either react or you can realize it like, oh damn, this is happening now. And uh, instead of reacting at first, let it go. So you take a few deep breaths or you, you do a visual PQ rep, like focusing on, 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 on eyebrows or on the nose. Just getting out of your thoughts, and then it's it's a matter of seconds where this adrenaline rush just goes away, and you can think clearly and say, "Oh yeah, okay, what's the problem here?" And so it's not it's not this dance of negativity, my saboteur triggering your saboteur, and bam bam bam, because that's what we do because of our mirror neurons. It just goes like boof, 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 right, which is very unhelpful. I call that uh, a, a shaman once told me that's called trauma bonding. And when you have a lot of that bonding, it's like two eagles locked in, in claws, you know, going all the way down and yeah. or escalating all the way up like a volcano. So that's a, that's a part that's really tough for a lot of sensitive people, including myself, that I'm having a good day. Namaste. Even when I meditate, I become more sensitive. So it, the problem gets worse. That when you're more sensitive uh, and I'm all in a, a, a beautiful space, I end up seeing somebody who is in a negative energy, like sometimes my wife is overwhelmed and <coughs> I don't see in my mind, I immediately rush to judgment or I, I, I go to a defense of going, okay, no, it's all cool. No, it's fine. Okay. Now you're getting me. Now you need to stop. No, 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 no. So no matter of looking at my lips or her lips seems to matter in those situations because I'm feeling the energy on, uh, on many different levels. So how does, how does you, how, how do you handle that mirror neuron problem? Well, that's an interesting, that's a, that's a very interesting example. What you uh, shared there. Um, there is a, there's a very distinct moment. There's an event and then there's this feeling that's being triggered. And then there's this moment where you, where you have these habitual patterns that are again, uh, creating a certain behavioral pattern. And it's just before the feeling that arises that you cut this thing. You can take it for what it is. It's like when you're meditating, you're observing yourself. This is no different. You're observing, you're not doing this. It's your saboteur saying, hey Brent, you should be doing this because if you don't react that way, this and that and that will happen. It's on your shoulder and saying this, it's there to protect you. But you mm -hmm. could say very kindly, look, thank you very much, Mr. Saboteur. Uh, thank you for protecting me, but I can handle this situation. Um, and I choose to do something different here. I see what happens. My wife is feeling X and Y and I sense it with all my body. And um, 
thank you for being here. Let it go. Your saboteur goes. And, but that's very easy said, of course. It's the moment that you is training yourself in making that distinction. So these trainings uh, are not necessarily in the moment of the trigger. They're happening outside as well You to do these type of uh, PQ trainings. Yeah, if not, you would need, you would need to uh, look for bad situations all the time. Life throws them at you anyway. So uh, you basically train yourself. If you do the, the foundation training, you do it three times a day, um, a two-minute PQ rep where you're really, you're really sitting down, you put your headphones on and you close your eyes or you don't, and you do these, these, these habits. And after, after a several number of weeks, this becomes a habit. And you notice immediately, I've, I've got a lot of people reporting even in the second week that they said, whoa, I was so surprised. I reacted completely different to a situation where normally I would have exploded. And so then they see like, hey, there is really, there's a different way of reacting. And so that positively feeds you already. And so that's how these things start to shift and to change. It is such a liberating feeling to know that you are not your saboteurs. That is that because quite often people say, Yeah, well, that's the way I am. Well, that's not true. That's not the way you are. In the inside, you're a very good, complete person. It's just being covered up by all kinds of stories and things shouting on the shoulder. And that's not the truth. You you don't have to accept that. It just makes your life so much lighter and the life of the people around you as well. Yeah, you sound it sounds like you're a lot better person to be around. Since it's only two minutes, would you be able to guide me through that two minutes? Yeah. Of the exercise of a PK? Yeah, you could do that. Yes. Okay. You want to do one now? Yes. So uh what we could do is that you uh you have some sound around you. Yes. Okay, good. Then uh I would like to invite you to close your eyes gently. That's right. And now you listen to the sounds that are nearby you. You can listen to your heartbeat. You can maybe listen to um, little whispering of birds if there's if you're next to uh, nature. And listen to your breathing. And now I would like to like you to listen to the sound that is the farthest away from you. Maybe hear a car or a plane or somebody running up the stairs. Now you can go back to listening to your heartbeat again. Now you can listen to the far away sound. The far is the way. And when you are ready, you can open your eyes again. It wasn't even two minutes, but how, how did that make you feel? Present, peaceful, energized. I have more energy and I'm in my feelings right now. So I'm engaged and I feel like just have, like I've had a nap. Yeah, and that's what it, what it does. It just, it's so simple, nearby, far away. And you can do that at any, any moment. You can do the same thing with a visual PQ rep. <clears throat> For example, you focused on the on the details. Let's assume you focus on my eyebrows when we're in a conversation or you take something visual which is around you. 
like a, a, a plant and you start focusing on the details of the leaves of the plant. You zoom in and then you zoom out again and you see it a bit more vague. Mm -hmm. And when you zoom in, you look really at the detailed structures of, of the leaf. Really, really um, focus on that. So you immediately you're distracted from what's on your mind and you focus on that thing. Same goes if you do a PQ rep. What's a, what's a beautiful way of training? This is really, uh, which by the way is, is anyway a super thing is if you just take a walk outside and you start by just feeling the surface under your feet, feeling the skin, uh, the the the, temp the temperature on your skin, maybe the wind passing you, all these sense sensorial things, the smell birds nearby a plane far away and so you can just have a walk and do that it's it's like a walking meditation and it's just a play what can i hear what can i focus on and it just very quickly calms down everything and if you do that in a forest with all the all the essential oils and all the stuff that you have in a forest you just become like whoosh, super zen very quickly but you can take that and call that back when you're right in front of a meeting let's say you have back-to-back -back meetings which that's what happens a lot with uh, <clears throat> with busy business people they've got one meeting after the other and they just they come from the energy of one meeting sometimes completely wound up over a phone call and they have to jump into the next one and if you can then just take two minutes to center yourself and set your the, the intention for the next call you go in with a completely different energy you're rejuvenated and that makes all the difference and you'd be surprised because it happens so often that people who do this this six week uh, foundation training they say i really had a hard time taking two minutes to do the exercises and they feel guilty like oh no i haven't done it nobody does it 100 percent perfect and it shows how busy we are and how unpresent we are at times whereas you would say Okay, I just need two minutes to center myself. It's nothing. Two minutes doesn't make any difference to the meeting, but it makes all the difference in the way how you show up. It, it, it reminds me a bit that we all have when you meditate the monkey mind and that monkey mind creates a story that just is compelling and more significant, the more energy, anger, you know, all the emotions that run into that story. And getting somebody to get out of that story when things urgently uh, need to be resolved negatively, they're showing up going, I got to handle this now. This, what you're, what this does is it, it doesn't suppress the emotion. No, it, it, but it does detach yourself from it. Where does the emotion go then? Cause you don't want to bottle it up. If you really have a, a, a difficulty with somebody you really need to say, hey, this this isn't working. But that's a crucial conversation piece then. So what, what? how do you deal with that anger then in a more resourceful way? Well, let's say something, a colleague of yours does something that really triggers your saboteur. In a normal situation, you would say, you would start, your judge would appear and he would say, but you've got, you've done this wrong. Rah, rah, rah. You're pointing or my your kids, mind. right? They get, I get practice with them, right? Yeah, but your kids. You say, yeah. you should have done blah, blah, this and that. You've got right. this little creature with big eyes and he's just being a child. It's like that. What's the problem? And you're getting angry at me. You're just being a child. But for you, it's like, come on. It's, I want you in, in bed so I can spend some time with your mom. And it's been long enough now. I've had a stress day, blah, blah, blah. You should sleep now. Because if not tomorrow, you're tired. Well, you could see your kid for, for who he is, a child. And you don't have to react to his behavior. It's your saboteur telling like, uh, no, a child should behave like this. Maybe your parents told you this or you were raised like that. This is how you raise children. This is how you're supposed to behave and, and, and so on. And uh, so this is what your saboteur is telling you. But you could also say, you know, this is my child. My child needs a feeling of safety, needs my love. And so just knowing that your mirror neurons trigger his mirror neurons, it can make you take a completely different decision. You can say, you know, I understand. And 
uh, let's go, I'll put you into bed. You quiet him down, maybe say a few words. And even if you're in a hurry, you say, yeah, dad is in a hurry now because he wants to spend time with mommy. Um, and you just touch him a bit, which is in, in its own a PQ rep. I've done that with my daughter where she was really completely wound up, just asking her to close her eyes. And I was just touching her forehead. And then it just, she focused on that. And then she, she was quiet and she fell asleep. And so that's how we can use it. And at the same time, you feel in a lovingly way, you feel in control and you feel like, wow, this is, this is a positive feeling. And so then you can go away. That's a way you can use it, for example. It's There's a lot more applications that what you actually get from the book or from, from, the, from the training itself. That's just the introduction to what is possible. It's more like a way of looking at life and at things and at people. And I think. In, in that moment, you got to the sage moment, which yes. is a much more hopefully resourceful decision that's going to be that brings more of a long term satisfaction than the short term release of anger and anxiety that create an immediate uh, uh, want, um, need to resolve the situation forcefully. Yeah. Well, the, and the situation 99% of the times resolves itself. The energy just drips out, it leaks out, and it's gone. Nothing happens. It's a rush. Nothing more, nothing less. With with a story that we attach to it. So the the wor the ways that I have seen people manage triggers is through the rain method, where you recognize the anger, you am accept the feeling uh you maybe do anaprana breath feel it to have the have the energy of the fire run through your whole body and then you investigate i rain r-a-i investigate it the, and see is it true well this is this really the story uh are you sure you know you katie buyer in it you know are you sure it's true but if the yeah. opposite was true and then you nourish yourself or looking connected to the needs of what you want. This, this uh, approach seems to really uh, develop all of these skills, but it's, you're using, you're recognizing the saboteur, you're accepting, uh, you're accepting it in some way as the feelings, but you're also moving, almost uh, detaching from it so that you can investigate it in a much more nourishing way. So it's kind of like this in between there of the accepting of the feeling and then going five things that you can, you know, touch far and wide and, and hear and smell and taste, and then investigating in a much more resourceful way that then the situation begins to mirror a much more nourishing place. And in that place, you can then take action, right? Yeah, that's it. But if you do that in a systematic manner, the world around you just changes. You mean on an organizational level? Or what do you on mean any by level. systematic? Um, well, it's it, the way if you change because you're more aligned, you're more quiet, people will react differently to you. They will open up more. They will feel more safe to you, with you. If you're a leader, that's super important. But everybody is a leader in, to, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So you'll just be a, a, a much more pleasant person to hang around with. Sure, I bet. So And... Uh, Sorry, I cut you off. No, I just uh, because we're we're actually uh, we learn by mimicking others. So if you're being a good example, people will just take over that habit as well. They like being around you. Sure, it's it's, it's like literally the door goes open and anything becomes possible. Are there uh, other than the PK PQ exercises? Are there other habits that the book endorses so that you're not in such a fight flight freeze response like meditating exercise working on an alcoholic diet uh getting your eight hours of sleep are there other areas that are uh having you be more resourceful so that you can have the mindset of the zone of genius well, that's not that's not specifically mentioned in the book. I think the book is very uh, masterful in pointing exactly giving you this this uh, mental fitness tools and the insights of the mechanics around that. But uh, you rightfully point out that 
this is one part of having a, a very well balanced life indeed uh, drinking enough eating well sleeping enough uh, is also and getting enough movement is also uh, another big part of that and that makes that can make your life complete and those are all factors you can actually control i i also noticed that it, there's a uh, a risk as well as a payoff for tracking your saboteurs and when you go into them. Through journal journaling, there are some cathartic techniques to get things off your chest that may actually increase the anxiety, whereas another person writing everything down is a release because they're no longer carrying the story inside them. What is the recommendation for tracking negativity? Well, tracking negativity is, uh, th there is not, no, no such thing as negativity. There is an event and you give it a label. So you could actually journal the event and then you can choose how you label the event. Mm. You can label it as negative and it could be that the negativity is induced by a saboteur. So then you've recognized the saboteur pattern or when you label it, uh, you, you label or you see it, and you can start looking at it and say, where is the gift in here? Or where is the opportunity in here? And so you can start to, even if it's not directly obvious from the moment one, you can develop this habit of having the um, the, the trust that it will, or the faith. Well, it's more, it's, it's not much so much about belief. It's about knowing that it will turn into something that is ultimately be positive for you. I got it. So he's not a fan of just going cathartic and going dark and just getting angry and getting it all out, right? It's it, to release the energy. It's more like, ah, as soon as you get it, don't try to escalate it further. You've now listened to the emotion. You've uh, understood that it is trying to communicate with you. And now you're moving saying, thank you for being the me messenger sa saboteur. And now with my zone of genius, I'll take it from here. Yeah. Just like that, it's you got a whole team in your head, and which is actually fantastic. But you need to be in charge of that team, and you can say just very lovingly, "Thank you very much for taking me to the place where I am right now." But I can handle it from here, and that is, we don't. Well, it's not really mentioned like that in the book, but it's. I, I think it's an it's an even more gentle approach of dealing with your saboteurs at times. You don't have to push them away. What you do in, with uh, positive intelligence is train your, your mental muscle so your sage becomes stronger and, and then automatically your saboteurs become smaller. They don't disappear. They don't even have to. It doesn't matter. Um, but I think it goes faster and it's easier when you even acknowledge their presence and you just, you're just you happy for them to be there. You're, you're grateful. And uh, then they're no longer threatening. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, some people really are uh, identified with anger and high, high blood pressure because of that competitive nature that they have. And they like being angry because they get gets them to do more. And there's a payoff. But what you're seeing there is that that doesn't have to be the, the case and that they that you're, you're saying, hey, stay competitive, just don't be so angry about it, and move into a much more resourceful uh, place. Yeah, because the anger is taking away energy that you could use to reach your goal in a positive manner. Mm. It's same thing with anxiety too, right? I would say so, yeah. Anxiety is on it, on its own. Uh, what is anxiety? That's a constant state of fear, whereas fear in the beginning makes sense. I mean, it's it's an alarm. And there is another, there's another thing to fear. I mean, you have the fear, like if there's a fire and, and, and then, then you should be frightful. You should run. It makes sense. It's a survival mechanism. But then again, things like stage fright, uh, fear is often there is, well, there it's more like adrenaline that prepares you, your body for uh, creating a top performance. And we have linked that story because it feels more or less the same as fear. And so we made a story that this is fear. Something will go wrong. 
and then we're focusing on things going wrong and that's why we can just completely paralyze whereas there again it is like your body preparing yourself say wow you know i'm in it with you i'm your friend let's do a top performance let's get everything ready in your body your muscles and your heart pumping and your brain that you got like super sharp thank you very much but that's not fear that's adrenaline and we call it fear because quite often before something went wrong in our childhood we had the same feeling and then we went flat on our face and we got laughed at and that's so we're not going to try that again it's some kind of an anchor that we've got in our mind but uh and when when you constantly have this thing yeah, it becomes anxiety but those are just loop stories in your mind basically yeah and your way of breaking people addicted to that anxiety would be to to just recognize what is the saboteur that's wanting to be expressed there yeah uh not necessarily i would dig in a bit deeper there to see what where the pattern comes from and then rewrite the pattern and then maybe use something positive and indeed maybe the servitors would play a role could be but otherwise we would say okay uh, and help them switch to say yes but there's there's yeah a bit more work to that perfect well uh this has been brilliant um being with you and hearing how all of this is put together I now feel way more positive about positive, positive intelligence and uh, can, I think uh, the, the viewers would be very interested if I could share this with other people, this, this uh, conversation uh, for other people, could you maybe say a little bit about what you do and if they wanted to contact you for more information uh, and what are the different services that you provide? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn or through my website, flowandmatter.com. Um, and the services that I provide, yeah, it's very much um, made to measure. So I do have basic uh, foundation training for PQ. That, that's one of the things that I do. But a lot of times it's incorporated in a program that's a longer time. So I mostly work with founders and CEOs who really need the space to think. And this is one part of what we do. Um, I help people uncover their dreams, the stuff that they have inside that really makes them thrive again. So often things that they've put away uh, for, for a very long time. And to put it really plastically, I think that everybody is born as a shiny white sneaker and life is going through a muddy field. And so at the end of this field, you have this big ball of mud around it. You don't move forward anymore. Or it's very energy consuming and... Uh, it doesn't look nice either. So what we do is spray off the mud. So you're a shiny sh sneaker again. Uh, you see that again and that you allow to uh, embrace that and, and be the person who you are, light, present, and doing what you're here for. Um, so that's that's what I do. But it's really, uh, I design that together with the people that, that come with me because everybody is, is a di different stage and has different needs for that. Yeah, but I think for the people who are interested in, in uh, doing a, a foundation training for positive intelligence, of course, they can always send me a, a message through uh, LinkedIn and uh, I'm more than uh, willing to help them out. Absolutely. Because it's an amazing tool. It also seems like your interpretation of the work is very valuable beyond what the work is because you have field experience on and how it can be applied to you know companies and then how maybe to become a practitioner yourself and to guide them into that as well as if they are constantly triggered by an issue what the specific training you could you could go into as well as if they are carrying surface anxiety and and you can dive into a, uh to, to the feelings underneath that are uh that where they're feeling not resourced and rewrite the script or a pattern uh, that brings them into uh, a much more confident story in their life. Yeah, I think we're all here for a, for a reason. And uh, I think the best thing is that at the end of your life, you can look back and say, wow, this was just an amazing journey. And uh, I want everybody to have that feeling. And uh, just be proud of yourself. You can look in the mirror and you say, wow, it's another wonderful day. Even if the day is shit, uh, you know, I can handle this. And it's okay. It's okay that today is shit and that the whole week might look like shit, but I can handle this. And it's totally fine because if I zoom out, 
you know, in the end of the day, it's an amazing journey. We can create something beautiful for other people on this planet. And I think that's what's, uh, what's making life so exciting. Bart, thank you so much. I really do appreciate uh, if you need to contact you uh, or even have a discovery session or something like that. Can you repeat how they, they uh, 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 your website and uh, what it is that uh, uh, you, you can offer to get them uh, started and, and maybe the price range, or at least uh, I'm sure it, it, you, it varies by, by person. But what's yeah, your final it, it depends on the trajectory that you're doing. So uh, if anybody's interested, the best thing they can do is just reach out, reach out through either my LinkedIn page or through my website, which is flowandmatter.com. And um, my LinkedIn page, you can put in the in the show notes. Maybe that's uh, that's easier for them to find. It's uh, Bart van Grinsven on LinkedIn, but uh, it's a hard one to to <laughs> spell here. I think for a lot of people. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so, so much.